Welcome to Efficient Iterations with Python Iterators and Iterables. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. In this course, you'll learn about iterables, the iter and next built-in functions, iterators and the iterator protocol, generators and the yield keyword, generator expressions, and the sequence protocol. The code in this course was tested using Python 3.12, but any supported version of Python from 3.7 up will work. Sometimes it can be fun to drill down on something that you've taken for granted. For example, have you ever considered just how a for loop actually works? What kinds of things can you iterate over? What kinds of things can go after the in keyword? And how does the loop get the next item doing the actual iteration? Sure, there are loads of built-in things you can iterate on, but can you write your own? Well, the answer to that last one is yes. Iteration in Python is based on the iterator protocol, which is a loose definition of class methods that get used by the for loop and other code that iterates. This course covers just what it means to be an iterable, how iterators are related to iterables, and how you can write your own code that implements the iterator protocol. Next up, I'll dive in and explain just what it means to be an iterable and how iterators work with them. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll introduce you to the concept of iterables and how they interact with iterators. In English, to iterate is to say or do something again, or again and again. Repetition. See repetition. Department of Redundancy Department. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll stop now. Raise, stop iteration. You'll get that later. An iterable in Python is an object that can be iterated over. You can go through its contents over and over. Objects, which are sequences in Python, like lists, tuples, and strings, are iterables, as are containers, such as dictionaries and sets. Let's go play with a few of these in the REPL. Consider a list containing some numbers. I can use a for loop to iterate over the object. In this case, numbers is an iterable. The for loop visits each item in the iterable, putting it in the variable num, and then does whatever is in the body of the loop, which in this case is print something out. This results in the items in the iterable each being printed on their own line of output. You can do the same thing with a tuple. Same idea with the loop. And a similar result. Now let's try a dictionary. This dictionary contains people's names mapped to their ages. Bob is 42, Jen is 51, and Raj is 15. You can use the for loop to iterate over a dictionary. When you do so, the object extracted for each iteration is a key in the dictionary, which in this case is our names. The dictionary object has methods for getting different kinds of things out of the dictionary. You can iterate over the results of the keys method as well. This results in the same thing as iterating over the dictionary itself. The values method can be used to iterate over the values in the dictionary. And there are our ages. The items method is used to iterate over a series of tuples, each of which contains the key and value pair. So what gets printed is a tuple for each line containing the name and age. The for loop allows you to use a tuple as the destination value for the iteration. This causes the tuples to be unpacked into variables. In this case, I'm still iterating over the response to items, but this time I've separated the results into variables instead of accessing them as a single tuple. It's just another way of doing the same thing, but 
shortcuts you into the variable you might be using inside of your loop. So just how does the for statement work? For iterates over an object using the iterator protocol. A protocol in Python is a loosely defined interface that accomplishes something. This typically is based on one or more methods that the protocol uses on a class. As the name iterator protocol might imply, it expects an iterator object. Iterator objects are used to iterate over an iterable. And at risk of this being a circular definition, an iterator object is one which implements the iterator protocol. When the for loop uses the protocol, it calls two built-in functions, iter and next. The first one, iter, is used on an iterable to create an iterator object. I'll show you this for real in a minute, but an example is calling iter on a list. What comes back is a list iterator object. The iterator object is responsible for returning each item to the loop. Let's stop and think about this for a second. Why use a separate object for iteration? Well, you've got to track the current item to be returned somewhere. And Python's answer is to store that information in an iterator object. You want this to be distinct from the iterable because you could have multiple iterators attached to the same iterable at the same time. Once for has instantiated an iterator by calling iter, the subsequent step is to call the built-in function next. Each time next gets called on an iterator, the iterator returns the next item in the iteration. If I am iterating over a list with three items, the first three calls to next each return the first, second, and third items respectively. And how does the for loop know when to stop? That would be by catching the stop iteration exception. When an iterator is complete, calling next on it raises a stop iteration. Hence my joke, that's probably a little generous, hence my reference earlier about raising a stop iteration exception on the Department of Redundancy Department repetition jokes of repetition. Yeah, I'll stop now. Let's head back into the REPL and see this in action. Once again, I have a list. And when I call iter on the list, what I get back is a list iterator object. Let me do that again, this time storing it in a variable. And now I can call next on my iterator object. The result is the first number in the iterable list. If I call next again, I get the next value. Two. And deja vu gives me three. Finally, because the iterator is finished, next causes the stop iteration exception to be raised. Now that you've seen the concept, next up, I'll dive deeper into the structure of iterator objects and show you how to write your own. In the previous lesson, I introduced you to iterables and their companion iterator object classes. In this lesson, I'll show you exactly what makes an iterator class an iterator class. In lesson two, I explain that the iterator protocol is based on two built-in functions, iter and next. Under the covers, what those two functions do is invoke corresponding class special methods, double underscore iter and double underscore next. These kinds of double underscore special methods are sometimes known as magic methods or as dunder methods. Dunder being short for double underscore and being easier and more fun to say. Dunder iter is used in two places, in objects that are iterables and for objects that are iterators. An iterables dunder iter is responsible for returning an iterator object, like the one you saw with the list iterator in lesson two. This can be a little confusing. Both iterables and iterators use dunder iter. In an iterable, it returns an iterator object for the iterable. And for the iterator, it returns itself. It's done this way so the for loop or any other construct using the iterator protocol doesn't have to know the difference between an iterable and an iterator. It merely calls iter in either situation. For an iterable, it gets a newly constructed iterator. While with an iterator, it gets said same iterator. This keeps the underlying code simple, 
The protocol doesn't have to do any introspection. It just calls iter either way. This has an interesting consequence. All iterators are iterables as they implement the dunder iter method. Not all iterables are iterators, though. Iterables don't have to implement dunder next. That's what the iterator associated with the iterable is for. All this feels a bit like word salad. Let's go into the REPL and see if an example helps to clear up this subtle distinction. I'm going to create a class called cats, which is a container for different kinds of cat strings. This underscore cats private member in the cats class contains three types of cats, lions and tigers and not bears. Oh my. Let me instantiate the class. And I'll attempt to iterate over it. The cats class doesn't implement dunder iter, so a type error gets raised, telling you this isn't an iterable. And of course, seeing as the for loop does the same thing, I get the same error. Let's implement a cat iterator that iterates over the cats class. Inside dunder init, I need a reference to the thing being iterated over. I've gone with the generic name underscore data. When iterating over the cat names, I need to know where in the list that's used as the data structure that I currently am. So I'm storing an index value for the list, starting with the first item at zero. To be an iterator, this class needs a dunder iter and a dunder next method. The dunder iter simply has to return itself. Again, this is to make iterables and iterators consistent for the for loop and anyone else using the iterator protocol. Next is, well, dunder next. This is where the actual work of the iteration gets done. First, I check whether I've reached the end of the list of cat names. If I have, I raise a stop iteration exception to indicate that I'm done. This line is where I figure out what value to return. I access the current item in the underscore cats list using my current underscore index. Then I increment the index for next time and return the cat's value. And that's it. You've got a cat iterator class. Let me try it out. Remember, cats itself isn't iterable, so I have to instantiate the iterator by hand and use that in the for loop. But by doing so, I now have code that works with the for loop printing each of our kitties Manually instantiating an iterator object is a pain in the butt, and it would be far more convenient to make the cats class iterable. Let's see how that's done with a new class. This is a similar dunder ident, but this time with doggy names. This method isn't strictly necessary, but it is convenient. Dunder len gets called when you use the built-in len function on an object. Implementing this will make our code slightly easier to read a little later on. The length of the dog class is the same as the length of the private member data inside. I could have hard-coded three, but instead of doing that, I've used len, so that way if I add a new doggy name inside of Dunder init, I don't have to remember to update this method. And here's what makes the doggy class iterable, the Dunder iter method. Inside of here, I need to return a new instance of a dog iterator object, which I'll define in a second. Has it been a second? 
As the dog iterator is only useful with the dog class, I've made it an inner class, hiding it away. This isn't necessary. You could define it elsewhere, but I like this pattern as it keeps all the logic together. Like with the cat's iterator, the dog's iterator stores the iterable being iterated and tracks an index. Also like the cat's iterator, dunder iter returns itself. Now comes the dunder next. In this line, I'm checking whether I'm done iterating. Note that in the cats iterator, I called len on self dot underscore data dot underscore cats. Whereas here, because the dog class implements dunder len, I can just use len on the class itself. And the rest of the dunder next method is used to return the current item in the iteration. Who let the dogs out? Well, there's a dated musical reference to a mediocre song that has a tendency to stick in your head. Google it, then come back for your apology. After that, I'll introduce you to Rick Rolling. Because I implemented dunder iter on dogs, it's iterable. So calling iter on it returns our dog iterator object. This, of course, means I can now use it directly in the for loop, unlike with the cats class. And there you go, an iterable dogs object. So that's what makes an iterator object. In the next lesson, I'll show you some examples where this can actually get used.